complexities of terrorism lying deep beneath the surface of the subconscious mind. That is the making of all this unkind. Children living in caves, hungry and cold, watching the sufferings of family members dying, starving, being shot, being taught, hatred and bias, it all took its toll. Brainwashing of lying radical religions that have nothing whatsoever to do with the brotherhood of man. Is this really the way the Holy Spirit planned? Imbalance of resources around our world, selfishness and greed, fighting about the generations already gone, terror in childhood, terrorism in adulthood, is that what happened? Frightening feelings, brainwashing and dealings on both sides of the land. Does violence and killing bring forth peace? Or does peaceful action bring forth peace? You decide, get rid of your pride, admit your wrongs, and then go on, looking inward and upward to the Holy One. What, oh what would he really do? Stop making this world feel so sad and blue. My father was a World War II veteran. He ended up coming home with, um, they called it battle fatigue back then. We call it today post-traumatic stress disorder. I remember how frightened we were when he would drink and he'd get into these places where he was reenacting some of the, of the war experiences that he had. My mother would take us down into the cellar because he'd come home and really be quite out of touch with reality. And there were nights we spent the night huddled together with her, and it felt like we were in a battle all our own. My mother lost her father when she was three years old. He was a World War I veteran, and how many times I saw her so full of grief. This little three-year-old inside of her had never been allowed to grieve the loss of him. When I was 17, I lost a boyfriend in Vietnam. I met Johnny when I was 12 years old. Uh, he was the paper boy, and uh, he never got my name right. <laughs> he always called me Caroline. I remember my mother coming in to the school. She looked so sad, and I walked over to her, and she said in my ear, Johnny, Johnny Roberts was killed in Vietnam today. I remember that moment as if it was yesterday. And I said, no, 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 he's not dead. And she said, honey, he is. So I remember going into the office and saying, I've got to go home. So the police came to pick me up and brought me to the house and um, I, I changed my clothes and I walked down to um, Johnny's parents' house because I, I was sure they were going to tell me it wasn't true, that there was some sort of a mistake. And when I walked in, everybody was in tears. Johnny's friend Tony was sitting on the couch and he looked absolutely bewildered and I knew, yeah, yeah it really was true. Sometimes it just feels like yesterday. You know, I'm sure that uh, there's many women out here in the world that lost their loved ones in the war in Vietnam, and there will be others uh, years from now that will remember the ones they lost in the war that's going on now in Afghanistan. Shut the 
39 years after Johnny's death, I learned that Stephen, Johnny's younger brother, was going to a memorial in Washington. And it just happened that I was going to be there at the same time he was going to be. And so we made a plan and decided to um, meet at the wall. And I told him and his wife, Karen, at the time, why don't we meet um, at midnight? And it'll be, you know, the quiet time for just us. I hadn't seen Stephen in many, many years, so it was very nice to meet up with him again. And what happened is uh, Karen went over to uh, 10 books that were lined up, um, and there were 58,000 men that had been killed there, and there were nine books that were closed up, and one book was opened up. And Karen looked down, and it was opened up to Johnny's name. Incredible. So we had a very, very teary-eyed memorial first memorial we did was there. The next day, I decided to go back, and I went to a place where they were selling POW bracelets, and I said to them at the time, are there POWs still there? And they said, yes. I said, I want one of those bracelets. How much? And she said, $10. So I gave her the $10, and she said, usually people pick in their state or closest to their state. So I looked down, picked up the bracelet, and I started to cry. And she said, what's the matter? I said, well, John's name was John Wayne Roberts. This man's name is John Wayne Lafayette. And I looked a little closer at the bracelet, and I said, oh, my. She said, what? I said, he got captured on 4 6 66. And she said, well, what does that mean? I said, that was my 16th birthday. Stephen called me up and said, Carol, I'd love it if you would participate in the traveling wall that's coming to South Portland. Would you come and sing the national anthem? It was a very exciting day for us because the wall was coming up in a gigantic truck and there was over 500 rolling thunder. Most of them were Vietnam vets that were coming up before the, the wall. I was actually the second person in on the motorcycle with the vice president. At the very beginning of the wall getting assembled, uh, Johnny's mother, Teresa, put her son's um, purple heart in the, in the apex. That was the heartbeat of the wall. And um, we felt very blessed. It was a sad moment and it was the beginning of a healing moment for Stephen and I. We had no idea how many people wanted to have their voice. Some of them were Vietnam vets, some of them were family members. Um, they came to the wall, they, they cried with us, they laughed with us, told us stories about their loved ones. They told us about themselves and what they've been doing since then. There were so many stories we heard. So it was really good for me, but I also realized I still, still possessed an awful lot of feelings about that war. A lot, a lot of things that I hadn't healed from. And I recognized that there was many people out in the world that hadn't healed as well. I was thrilled when Stephen said to me, Carol, why don't we take a trip and go to the village where Johnny was killed? I had all kinds of feelings running through me. And I remember uh, the day that we left, Stevie went to Asia before he went to Vietnam. And so I was to fly over to Vietnam by myself and land in Hanoi. Hanoi, Vietnam. I couldn't even believe that I was doing that. I kept saying to myself, oh my gosh. All through my teenage years, I was frightened of the word Hanoi, and here I was flying into it. I met Stevie there, and then our journey began.
to Hanoi. It's hard to believe I'm really descending into what was before a war zone. The North. The place I feared so much. Now here I am, embracing the people. There was nothing wrong with most of the people. Just the government that gave all the orders to kill the innocents. The ones who did nothing wrong. They were just all the pawns for an economic war. Killing the poor. The women. The children. What was their crime? To be set up to make a dime for the leaders? The bleeders? It was a very exciting morning when Stephen and I knew we were going to do a memorial that day. We were within miles of where he was killed. We weren't exactly sure, but we were right in the vicinity. So now this is all like the beginning of the DMZ going into Route 9. We're on our way to... When we went out on Route 9 that day with our guide, he got out of the car, walked across the street, and asked the village people, may we enter? And uh, they said yes, so Stephen and I, were, we, were, we had mixed emotions. Stephen especially, because I'm sure all his life he wondered, what was it like the last moments of Johnny's life? What really happened that day? To this day, we really don't know the complete story. We really don't know what happened. We don't know what happened, we just know that he was shot. 1967? Uh, it was a very hot day that day, and I had been taking malaria pills, so I wasn't feeling so good. But we started to meet the village people, to interact with them, and to feel so much great energy from them. And they, they seemed to enjoy us. Of course, we were giving them some $2 bills that we brought over because that was supposed to be good luck for them. And also little trinkets and presents for the children. And I remember at one point, I turned and I saw this young man. He was 12 years old at the time. And I took one look at him and I wondered what happened to him. And someone told me that this little boy had an Agent Orange because the gene had mutated into the next generations and there were thousands upon thousands of children born with the effects of Agent Orange, which reminded me of my cousin who was on Hamburger Hill that came home and uh, ended up having the eight pregnancies and six of the babies died and they were convinced that the Agent Orange that my cousin John had had an effect. So I was standing there with this little boy and I remember I couldn't contain myself. I turned around and started weeping. To this day, the chemicals are still affecting the soil and the vegetation and the people. After the people kind of cleared out, 
Stevie and I walked in and I said, you know, Stevie, uh, Johnny died in a foxhole and this kind of looks like a foxhole. It could have been the foxhole he died in. We didn't know. I said, let's get down here and do the memorial here. And <clears throat> as <clears throat> we put his picture up there, we held hands and just looked at each other and realized that our hearts had been broken so many years before, but that we still felt the sadness of the loss of him. We held hands and we prayed, and um, I don't know, it was a special moment in a way because it, it almost like we were saying to him, we really never forgot you, we never abandoned you, we came back to where you were last alive. We believe that in this section of uh, the village, this is where you resurrected to heaven. And we were so happy to be able to go back and, and retrace the steps of, some of the steps of where you had walked in Vietnam. We felt, um, we felt really complete. There were days when I didn't get out of bed. There were days when I just pulled the covers over my head. There were days when I wished I was dead. Like you, Johnny. No more pain. No more blame. No more war that tore me into the core. Just relief from it all. Letting me out from the pain of it all. Then something would happen, like when God sent Douglas to me and our three little children to take care of and love. A newness of purpose, a newness of bliss. Loving these new little spirits gave me hope, gave me life once again. Even though I never forgot you, I had to go on. The week the wall was there, um, the Friday night ceremony, a colonel got up and started talking about how Johnny was killed. They thought it was the C2 bridge in Vietnam. The colonel claimed that they renamed the bridge Bastard's Bridge. And I remember sitting there saying, what a terrible name that is. But I said to myself, boy, I'd like to go back there and rename that bridge Resurrection Bridge. And um, I did get that chance. We felt a little bit uncomfortable of how he actually died. Found out more than I bargained for. Uh, it's all good. Unfortunate for a lot of people that had POWs and people, uh, other, other uh, uh, military uh, that died in the Vietnam War that were unable to find out what happened to their loved ones. So I feel very fortunate. Uh, the man upstairs has, has blessed me with that. And to the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'm going to be very brief this morning, because truly today's ceremony is about the fallen soldiers we are all honoring, as well as the veterans who are here with us today. I'm truly grateful to every one of you for your service and for your family's service. Gold Star Honorable Service Medal is presented to the families of those who died in combat theater on or after December 7, 1941. To date, the State of Maine Gold Star Honorable Service Medal has been presented to 288 families of over 3,000 Mainers who have made the ultimate sacrifice in the defense of freedom around the world. John Wayne Roberts. Private First Class, United States Marine Corps, Vietnam, South Portland. Receiving the medal on behalf of the family, John's brother, Steve Roberts. Steve, thank you. You and your family for your great service. Appreciate you too. How can I know you? My pleasure.
please understand how much this means to me for what your families gave. Too often we remember the soldiers, but we never remember the families they left behind. And that's what this was about today, was trying to make sure you understand. We do care, we do remember, and we will never forget. Forty years after the fact, and to be able to still get a you know a, a medal of recognition of what what Johnny and the other boys have done is just just uh, amazing. That uh, people don't forget after forty years. A friend of mine uh, went to high school with Johnny, and they used to have go and have beers, and uh, they were quarter beers back then. So he lives out in uh, Utah now, and so every time he comes to Maine. Dale Hilton puts a quarter down for, for the beers that Johnny always bought him way back. For the memories of the of the quarter beers. <laughs> this is the Western Union telegram that was sent to my mom, along with two Marines, uh, informing her of uh, Johnny's death. I remember having lunch with the assistant secretary of the army from the Pentagon and he asked me, should we tell families what happened to their, their loved one when they were killed in the war? And I said, if they want to know. And if they don't want to know right off, if they want to know one year later, two years later, five years later, I think it's their right to be able to ask and be told if they want to know. I think it's up to each individual to be told the truth if that's what they want. The reason that I did the poster in the first place was I would go to sleep at night, I'd see visions of the poster, and I'd say, wow, what am I supposed to be doing with this? All these beautiful icons that had meant so much to me in my life. I saw the vision of the Dalai Lama, I saw Gandhi, I saw Mother Teresa, Jesus. Um, the Islam symbol, the Star of David, even though Islam was something I didn't really know a lot about at that moment in time, I kept asking God, well, where do you want me to put the Islam symbol? And God kept saying, put it next to the Star of David. So I thought that made sense, put it together, because I want them to live in peace and harmony. And in the poster, I had uh, Ted Kennedy, I had Obama and Biden, Above that, I had the uh, Star of David, the Islam symbol, and then I had the Dalai Lama, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Jesus, and Buddha. And at the very top, I kept seeing the Kennedys and Martin Luther King. So I ended up putting Robert on one side, Martin Luther King in the middle, and John on the other side. It just seemed like the people that were the most inspirational to me when I was a child would were all of those, all of those icons. So I came out onto the streets of Boston and started asking, what do you think of the people on this poster? What do you think of the poster? And um, I realized that 9-1-1 um, happened and then the war started and it seemed like everybody wasn't able to have their voice. I wanted their voice back. I wanted my voice back. I wanted to now be able to express how I felt about people in war and how the assassinations affected my life personally. And I wanted everybody else to be able to express how a war affected them as well. So that's what I did. I took off um, to the streets and started asking people, what do you think of the war? You know, what do you think the causes are? What do you think the effects are? Okay, thank you. Sure, are you making postcards of it? Um, I hope to make stationary postcards, you know, other other forms of it. We yeah. want a world without terror. And uh, all mankind as one. Back in 1962, President Kennedy had just been elected. My fellow citizens of the world. There was so much hope in the country, just a sense of we could all do this together and make this world a better place. And that's how I felt. I felt very good about that time. And in November of 1963, 
when he was assassinated, life stood still, just like it did later in, with 911. It stood still for all of us then as well. Two years later, I started campaigning. I was a teenage Democrat. I was the chairperson of our, our town. I didn't quite know what I was doing at that time. I was still young, and, but I was kind of idealistic and thinking that maybe I could make a difference. I have a dream that one day this nation will I remember the civil rights bill coming up, and I was really elated. You know, when I was five years old, I picked with the migrant workers, and it was at that time I said, why are they living in such shacks? I couldn't understand that. In November of 1966 is when Robert Kennedy came to our town. So I went to the gate, and I walked right up to the airplane. Senator Muskie was there, Governor Curtis was there, and all these very important politicians were there. Jerry O'Toole was there, he was the president of the Teenage Democratic Program, who knew that I wasn't supposed to really be there. <laughs> and I looked up, and out of the doors came Robert Kennedy, he came down the stairs, and he reached out his hand, and he held my hand while he was being introduced to the important people. When he finally turned and looked at me, I looked at him and I said, I'm only a teenage Democrat. And he laughed. And then my next thought was, I'm going to do something for you someday. And in April 4th of 1968, two days before my 18th birthday, Martin Luther King was shot. I have some very sad news for all people who love peace all over the world. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. In he dedicated his life to love and to justice between fellow human beings. He died in the cause of that effort. In this difficult time for the United States, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. You can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and a desire for revenge. Or we can make an effort to understand, as Martin Luther King did. We have to make an effort in the United States to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poet was Aeschylus. He once wrote, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair against our will comes wisdom through the awful grace of god my boyfriend was killed there when i was seven oh, oh i'm sorry that's Jesus. all right but this is his little brother and this is us 40 years later in the village where he was killed in vietnam and uh you know it just took a whole year to put this poster together because... wow. we've had difficult times in the past we will have difficult times in the future to what the Greeks wrote so many years ago, to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. It was so tough for this 17-year-old girl. I, I couldn't believe that we were at war, but I never believed that Johnny was really gonna die there. I thought he was gonna just come home in a year. And uh, that wasn't to be. He came home in about five or six weeks. Two months later, Robert Kennedy was shot. So there was my boyfriend Johnny, Martin Luther King, and then Robert Kennedy shot. And this was my senior year of high school. And seven days after Robert was shot, Tony, Johnny's best friend, went to Vietnam. About four and a half years ago, I was in the church in Palm Beach. I was in a passionless prayer meeting, and Ethel was behind me for four days in a row, and I got to shake her lovely hands. Nick, our brother-in-law, was the one who talked him into joining the guard, I think. And um, he, he liked the flying. I think Nick talked him into going to flight school. I and, see. Uh, he was sent first from the National Guard to OCS, 
then he went into flight school mm -hmm. and um, he, he was a crackerjack. He, was, he, he did a great job. He went in August of 65, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And shot down April of 66. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And Kathy stayed with you, his wife. Yeah. They were newly married. Yeah, basically. In three days. How did you find out? Oh, that day, I was at home with Michael, our youngest son. He had chicken pox or something. And uh, then someone came and rapped on the door, and I opened the door and I saw Chaplin. So I knew right then that something was wrong. And he said, Mrs. Lafayette, and I said, yes, but not the right Mrs. Lafayette. Mm -hmm. And then I called our neighbor and I said, please warn Kathy and Rowan that something has happened to John and a military chaplain is coming. The last transmission that had come from John was, hurry up, they're all around us. Yeah, the they're surrounded. Closing in. All around us. And that was it. That was the final. So you waited, and, and what was the government saying to you? Nothing. We didn't know hardly anything until there is a military historian who lives here in Waterbury, Brian Lindner. Mm -hmm. And when we had the story in Montpelier, um, he started um, researching it. And, he, and he's the one that started all these um, documents from the military coming to us, right? Yep. Yeah. They, they brought me uh, books of... Uh, um, memos and uh, other things of that nature that were relating to John. There were three or four books and they were thick. But some of it was blacked out. Yeah. Some of it was yeah. blacked out. I don't know that they revealed very much of anything for quite some time. And I, I'm of the opinion it was more than months. Yeah. If you were to speak to the world about somebody missing in action like John was, what would you have wanted? Revealing what did happen. Exactly. For closure. And, yeah, and, and, to, and to get on um, with everything about John that we can take and place it to rest uh, certainly would be a, a real big um, step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. it, it's tough on even the ones with it, you know, the, the sons come home, but I can't imagine the feeling of. Mm. Where is he? I know, totally you know, not. that's got to be as tough as tough can be, you know. And I just wanted to say to you that I was so honored that I picked your brother's bracelet at the Vietnam Wall, mm -hmm. and he had the same first two names as my boyfriend. I know, who that's was amazing. Killed. Oh, and glad. it was my birthday that he yeah. got missing. There's got to be that's something amazing. incredibly spiritual about I know. that. I know. And I, I really want to present this bracelet to you, Roland. <laughs> You know, this is this is for you, and I just want you to know that all the time I was in Vietnam, my thoughts and prayers were with all of you, and I try my best to try to find out if I could find anything, and if there's still anything that I could ever do for you, I would do it. And, and when I go back to Vietnam, I hope to travel to Laos, and I hope to do whatever I can to help, okay? So I just want you to know that my heart is with both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. When I did obtain John Wayne Lafayette's bracelet, I felt so, um, I don't know, I felt like I had a mission. I was going to find out what happened to him, and if I couldn't do that, I had planned on bringing a plaque and some flowers and doing a memorial and taking pictures for them so they would have a little bit of closure. I did so try. However, it was so deep within the jungle. They had monsoons happening during the time that we were there. And so they wouldn't let us go. We knew the exact spot where he was last seen, and the Laos government wouldn't let us go. Doug, take one. Thank that you. woke me up. <laughs> We're sitting here with Doug McAllister. Back in the day, Douglas had a brother that went to Vietnam. And Doug, could you tell us about what that was like for you when your brother left for the Vietnam War? Sure. Uh, from what I can remember, it's a long time ago. 70s, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, no, actually it started in 69. David, okay. was, um, David was over there in 1969, and um, 
I was a senior in college in 1969, and um, <clears throat> he had been drafted out of college. He was going to um, agricultural college at the University of Massachusetts. The draft board told him that they were going to draft him, and uh, at that point, he enlisted, and they put him right in infantry training, and then over he went. And um, so I was, that was during my senior year in uh, college, and so I distinctly remember uh, getting a letter from him you know, on that military paper. They give you a free military letter writing paper, you know. Big deal. <laughs> and um, in that letter, he said to me, this is pretty bad over here, and you should do whatever you can do to get out of this, to avoid this. And uh, that sounded pretty scary to me. How did, how did you feel about the Vietnam War, and how do you feel about it today? I mean, what do you, when you're looking back on it, what was that war all about? Well, at that time, it sounded like um, it was justified, because that's what the politicians were telling us. You know, that if Vietnam fell, then the goodbye Asia, all of Asia was going to be swept with communism. and. Uh, we were told that the Vietnamese government and people really wanted us there, you know, and all this stuff that turned out later to be false. So at the time, uh, I thought it probably was the right thing to do. How did it affect your life? I mean, how did you feel with your brother being you know, over there, and, and what was it like for you that year that he was gone, and your family too? Yeah. I know it affected my mother and father greatly because they had not lost any children. And here's the threat of um, David being over there in the thick of things and being in the infantry and, you know, you don't sit around in a warehouse if you're in the infantry. Uh, they send you out. And he was a radio man and I believe that they were favorite targets uh, because if you could knock out the communication for a platoon or a unit, uh, that was, you know, a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so he carried the radio and was marked because of that. Of course, we didn't have any information uh, about where he was being sent, but there's that sword hanging over your head that he's out there being shot at or having to shoot at people. Mm -hmm. And um, there's always that possibility that uh, he could die. Um, yeah, I get hit twice, actually, Carol. Um, once in September, and then, um, but I stayed in the field for that because that was just more of the shrapnel. And then an RPG shrapnel, uh, we unfortunately uh, the wind wasn't blowing the right way and we walked into a base camp, an enemy base camp, and before we knew it, we were taking some pretty heavy stuff. And uh, fibers had to be lifted out. And so... So when that happened, um, did you think, okay, now I'm going home, or...? Oh, no, no, no. No, you only, if you got hit bad enough, mm -hmm. you went to Japan. I and see. if you went to Japan, you usually then went home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, mine was, it wasn't, I forget the term that we had for it, but it wasn't a home free pass, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't, I spent a week, week, week and a half in the hospital, and then it was back out in the field again. Did that surprise you that you had to go out again, or did you, did you feel like, oh... Okay. Infantry mm -hmm. is, um a very valued commodity for, mm -hmm. the, for the U.S. military. Mm -hmm. And so dwindling numbers is not good for the uh, DOD, Department of Defense, mm -hmm. you know, in infantry. So they, they send me back out, and yeah, well, they should have. I mean, I've still got eight or 12 uh, pieces in me. You know, mm -hmm. they took some out, mm -hmm. but uh, they patch you up, and they put you back out there to do your job. Yeah. 
I don't disagree with that mm -hmm. because the people who served in Vietnam were infantry. They did most 80% of the dying. Yes, you know? yes they did. Yes they did. So it, uh, now what do you think you were there for? What do you think the war was about? Why did? Why do you feel oh, that the we Cold entered war. in? It was the Cold, the Cold war. war. We're against uh, communism at the right. time. Right. And we were all ramped up about that in 58, 59, 60, mm -hmm. uh, 10 years before. We had a, fall, a bomb shelter, a fallout mm -hmm. shelter mm -hmm. in Carlisle on Kerr Street, you know? And um, so it was, they were bad people. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were taking over the world. You know, some of your, uh, some of the, your fellow soldiers, I'm sure that it was a little difficult watching them go because you always get so close. That's not fun. Uh, and, you know, war's not pretty. Like mm -hmm. I say, you don't want it on your home turf. What would you want for the soldiers coming back today? What would you like to be in place uh, to restore their health? The VA is on the right track with the PTSD. Mm -hmm. They've got some great people in place. Um, they also have some people in place that are idling. Mm -hmm. So I would like the guys or the VA to get the idlers out of there, you know, yes. therapist out, um, and get some new ones in, whether it takes more money or not, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because these kids are going to have some problems. Yeah. They really are. They're, um, I mean, they have, they didn't, you know, they were under different conditions than what we operated under, but they still, they had, they had fear every day. Mm -hmm. And that's what takes its toll, you know. And, and um, you know, if, when you're on guard all the time for a year, um, your heart rate goes up, your adrenal glands get enlarged, and, and it, that brings, you know, hormonal changes, and, and, and a lot of guys are touching themselves off. We had three in town here in the past two years, you know, they came back. And, um, I guess uh, to answer your question as best I can is just to the VA has to make sure that they're giving them all they can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The kids aren't going in yet. They yes. won't go in because yes. they're going to be drinking mm -hmm. and they're going to be they're going to be working their ass off because that takes your mind off what went on. They're going to be workaholics. Hopefully, mm -hmm. that might be a plus. Mm -hmm. If they can get jobs. Yes. If yes. they can't, yes. there's another problem. Mm -hmm. um, when when the soldiers, when your, your fellow soldiers came back and they did have problems with um, Agent Orange, for instance, you must know some, some people that came back with that. Elma um, Platt out of Pottsville, uh, no, uh, South, South Platt, South, oh, I forget, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I talked to him about eight years ago. Finally got him on the phone. He was, uh, I won't go into details, nice guy. Uh, he passed away at 54 from diabetes. Um, what do you say to him? I don't know. I can show you three or four veterans magazines, and uh, they're dying young. Mm -hmm. It really affected them. And I don't know if you know this or not, but David, uh, the, the gene mutated into the next generations. There's mm -hmm. still babies being born with Agent Orange. My cousin lost six babies um, from the result of it. I have a good friend uh, in town here who, um, his son was born with some major problems. And because he went into the Dow, uh, was it the Dow Medical Settlement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Agent Orange settlement mm -hmm. and got, I don't know, like three grand back in 78 or something. No. It's nothing. Mm -hmm. I know. You probably, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I, I think speaking to the government about, you know, not letting that stuff keep, keep slipping through the cracks mm -hmm. and really giving all the people that are coming back that have anything wrong with them to help them as much as possible. That's probably what she'd wish as we would, you know. But you know, in wartime, 
the soldier is, you know, let's raise the flag and blow the trumpet and stuff. Well, after the war's over, he's not needed anymore. Mm -hmm. So, probably, I, I hope I'm wrong, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure whether or not we're going to be as supportive of the returning troops as we should be. Would you mind telling us what happened that day when you walked in? Was it two days after the war had ended? Is that what it was? Well, I was walking along, peering into each one of the bot cars, and as I was walking by, I saw a movement of him, you know, waving like that. Wow. I, thought, I guess he heard voices, and he was trying to attack the attention. The, the, the 20, 42nd Rainbow Division of the U.S. Army marched into the Dachau concentration camp to liberate the camp to stop the killing and, and they found all of these uh, uh, all of these prisoners had been gassed and thrown into the boxcars that you can see in the mm -hmm. photo there. So then, then what did so you do? I called my uh, commanding officer who was just a few, few feet away from me he had already passed it, and I called him over and I said, hey, Colonel, we got a live one here. And, uh, so he, he came over and, uh, excuse me. He came over and he, uh, he, uh, he jumped into that boxcar and, uh, and picked up the prisoner and then he walked over. And, and, and handed, handed him to you. Handed him to me and the prisoner looked at me and he asked me, Fry, Fry, he's asked me, am I free? I said, yeah, you're free. <laughs> <laughs> My boyfriend was killed in Vietnam when I was 17. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking on the airplane. And I told her about Jimmy that you know we had lost uh, you know. Uh, yeah, uh, in uh, 1968. Yeah. He was a Navy hospital corpsman that was assigned to a Marine uh, uh, unit. He was wounded on April 4th, and he officially died on April 5th. The Marine Corps gets their medical from the uh, Navy because they're part of the Department of the Navy. So the Navy hospital corpsman go out into the field with the Marines and they were involved in a firefight and the uh, Viet Cong, the enemy saw him and they threw a hand grenade behind him and he took shrapnel in the... In Quang Tri. In Quang Tri, yeah. The same province as my yeah. boyfriend was killed. We talked about that, I right. think, it, as well. They took him to the Da Nang uh, military, you know, the Da Nang hospital and uh, that's where he passed away in Da Nang. Uh, yeah. And he was 20, is that he right? He was, uh, let's see, 68, April 68. He was just shy of his 20th birthday. He would have been 20 in June of that year. He was born in 1948. Who's that you speak of? Jimmy. I notice, I notice a flag over there. Is that Jimmy's that's Jim's, flag? That's Jim's flag. It's never that's been unfolded. That's what I thought. Unfolded. And it has the purple, purple heart. heart. And his, yes, and just the so. campaign ribbons that he got from Vietnam. But that's his purple wow. heart. And uh, that has not been unfolded since uh, he uh, was buried. They gave the flag to my mom. And, uh, Jim had, uh, shortly before he died, he went to Hawaii. A lot of the soldiers, uh, you know, Navy, they went to Hawaii for R and called R and R Rest and Relaxation. And Easter was coming up, so he'd ordered a corsage from my mom from Hawaii. And the corsage arrived after he was killed and after we were notified. And so the postman had to deliver this. And it was a small town, Danville, California, and everybody knew everybody. So the mailman had to deliver this box and my mom opened it up. I was home. My mom opened it up at the door on the doorstep and she screamed bloody murder and collapsed on the doorstep and the neighbor across the street ran, heard my mom screaming from across the street mm -hmm. and <laughs> And she ran to get my mom. She collapsed on the porch. <laughs> It's one of those, um, one of those times I know that I'm 42 years later and I still feel it like you guys, it could be like it was yesterday that um, I got my news. So I, I, yeah. one of the things that I think uh, that's very important to me is to make, let the world realize that 
that what how people feel affected even years later by somebody that we lose you know they go straight up but we have to stay back and we have to feel yeah. feel the effects of it and um, and we just want people to give, give them permission to feel those feelings that they probably buried inside them for so many years post-traumatic stress disorder shock brought on by loss of your brother your sister frozen feelings with dealings of trauma watching people blow up go up to the one who sent them down to the earth to love their brother their sister only to be taught later that they are your enemy who is your enemy is it the people of different color culture or land is it civilians who did nothing at all but stand in the streets with the bombs that fell down from the sky oh my god why god why are we so blind can't you see that it all causes ptsd uh, before only one route you know from north to the south and south to the north we call it route nine they call it highway number one we're going to route one number one to the hazon village We're so grateful that we can come back and honor what Chu did and other soldiers did in Vietnam and we just hope and pray to God that um, not only the soldiers that died here will not, not die in vain, that they'll always be remembered as very special to their families and to their friends and that we hope and pray to God that the war in in the Middle East will stop soon and that we'll all live in peace and harmony as God would want us to. Oh, it's so good to see him. We saw him before. He's the one that touched my heart yeah. when I was here. Đừng ngoài nữa rồi phải không? Okay. Uh, this boy go to the, you know, the village office yes. to have the gift from the government gave it to the uh, hand he grabbed uh, and right. right now he goes to the police office. This is where the little children live. And they never we stood right here and gave them gifts. You know, and uh, look after High Sơn village yes. because you know they need the help. Yes, we will. Go we will. Làm những việc đó. We promise to. Yes. <laughs> Can't help everybody, but we sure can help Hay Son village. You know what? This made my whole, I, I have to say, my whole year to do this. This was the best. Thank you, Tung. Remember to Steve back home to make the Worship right. table for John. Yes. He loved John. Yeah, he sure did love John, and and understandably so. John was a very special spirit. Yes. One that could make me laugh. I can tell you, even even if I felt sad. <laughs> and I just, I've always missed him.
escaped from the from this village, but on the way they got ambushed by both sides because they didn't know who was who. Incredible. This is an old school that they've kept as a memorial to what happened. Vietnam school destruction. Innocent people caught in the crossfire. Mothers, fathers, children fleeing for their lives, believing they were running to safety, caught with bullets from a conflict. What conflict? This was war that tore through the hearts of many, those who died and those who lived. Guess they didn't need that school after all. What do you think? outside and, and what what it's like right now in, in other parts of the world when, when children have to go to sleep at night and hear the sounds of bombs and not feel like they're safe. that there were no U.S. troops in this area. So they didn't need to hide the land so hard like at Fuji in the south. Mm -hmm. So they could move them to bomb craters. And at night, they could move them to uh, the ocean, to the sea there, just at night. You know that there are three levels in the tunnels, 12 meters deep, 15 meters deep, and 23 meters deep, three different levels. And the second and third levels have entrances on the beach, but the first level just have entrances on the hills. That's why they need ventilation. 1965, 66, uh, local people uh, dug 114 different tunnels. They moved down and lived under the ground. It's hard to be so proud of a B-52 bomber, but there used to be so much talk about, we got a B-52 bomber, and I never thought it was good. It's the entrance number three of the tunnels, and we start to go down. Be careful, step, the first step is not so flat. The idea is um, electric power today, but during the war, just candle. Where they put the light here, that is uh, where we have a candle. Because they live here a long time, the eyes will adapt to the dark. That is our general part of the tunnels. <laughs> Looks like the rock, huh? but it's a clay. You can dig it with your finger, mm. try and you can feel it. That's amazing. There on the left is the way going to the first entrance. And here is the way going to the second entrance. All of them go to the beach. And look down there. So it should be very wet, you see, because a lot of rain water come down. So that means running water coming to the tunnels, but follow that it go out to the ocean. So the mean here now here, 50 meters deep. This is one of the family room. Near like that, and you know, three of them stay here for a long time. Just enough for a bamboo bed. Okay? Yeah. Two years ago when I was in these tunnels, it was a desire of my heart to interview those babies that were born in the tunnels. I can't tell you how touched I am that they are willing to do this for us. Are they married? Yeah. Are the parents still um, living? The, I know the parents, um, man, still living. Oh. Yeah. So they have been in the tunnels. Hello. 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 I, I said, I wish I could meet the babies that were born in the tunnel, and now I meet you, and I'm, I'm very happy for this day. The same year Johnny died, the babies were born in the tunnel in the north. Johnny died in the south. What a blessing life went forward with these beautiful children to populate the needless losses of that bad, sad war. We go first back to the tunnels and uh, we will uh, see where they were born. That is a maternity room in the tunnels. Bombs, 
our bombs, their bombs, falling from the sky. The children playing in the sun were rushed to the places underground to hide from all the terror. Babies born inside this place, what a place to start your life, inside a dark, dreary tunnel with bombs bursting all around. What a terrible way to come into life with so much strife. <laughs> He was born on uh, uh, September the 9th, 1967. Uh -huh. Angie? Uh, I'm sing 18, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, and you know that when they come back, they said that tunnel is a very good place to play, a good place to play. And then he said that when he was born, uh, her mother said that they didn't have a bamboo bed like this, but just a, a, a mat and a carpet uh, with uh, some uh, banana leaves. Wow, you were born yeah. of the banana leaves. Yeah. <laughs> Does he like banana? Oh yeah, they have banana blend uh, around their houses. Eh? <laughs> 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 this is probably the best part so yeah. far of my trip, yeah. is to meet you two. Mm -hmm. These children were so resilient that they felt it was a game because they knew no other way. Yeah. It's better for children. And I think that's what people really need to understand, that everything war is horrible. And that um, we really, those of us who, you know, talk about it, film about it, write about it, we definitely want it to, you know, people to understand how it is. Because if you're in your little house, your nice little car, your nice little job, you don't see. And even though I find that uh, what I'm doing is difficult, I feel that I was called out to do it for some reason to bring to the light that this is not, the darkness isn't the way to go. The light is the way to go. And uh, and it just proves it every, every place I go. It just feels like on the day of my boyfriend's anniversary of his death, 42 years ago, I get to meet these children from North Vietnam that were actually born in a tunnel and survived. And I mean, to me, that is an amazing landmark. That makes me happy. Makes me happy. Uh, today in Vietnam, we compare Jackrong Bridge as symbol of the Ho Chi Minh Trail system in Vietnam. Just wow. So, that is a form of trails there. And before, it just a uh, narrow dust road, covered high trees. Wow. What happened during that battle? And how long did it last? In three days. But, you know, um, they uh, they come here and uh, located on the hills just after the Tid Offensive. Because uh, during the Tid after the Tid Offensive, you say they knew well that the Ho Chi Minh Trails in Laos uh, is very important for the north. It's 937 meters altitude. That is the main reason why they located here uh, at the Hamburger Hills. From here, they could control Laos border, the Ho Chi Minh Trails in Laos, the Ho Chi Minh Trail in west of Quang Chui province or Tiu Tien Hui province, and then they could control and stop them. There was 10,000 in the whole area, and 700 survived that. Is that is that what this? That's uh, the number we get from from uh, from books from uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, in fact, you know, none of them come back, and we don't know how many people kill, how many still survive. But the number is uh, hundreds and hundreds. A lot of them yes. kill around here. That's why we. It's, it, it, I think that's why they call it the Hamburger Hills. Oh,
in the um, Hamburger Hills area. And the top of the Hamburger Hills is almost the two other hills. And that is, you can see the bottom of that, those three hills there. That day, there had been such a storm that a lot of the trees had fallen down in front of the path. But we were determined to do what we had set out to do. And so we ended up climbing 853 steps up the side of the mountain. My intent was to remember everyone who was lost in that battle, not only on our side, but the other side too. Um, we knew who was lost in, in that battle because of the dog tags. The Vietnamese um, people didn't have dog tags, so many of them, you know, they just disappeared on their families and never were found again. And um, I went up the steps determined to just honor our boys who were lost in that battle and pray for everybody else that was lost as well and pray for everybody that had been affected by such a devastating time and just bring some light to even the people that are left behind now that still have the effects of Agent Orange. I was on a plane coming here with a young woman. Her father had been in Vietnam as well and had Agent Orange and died at age 41 and this young woman had a heart defect because of his effects from Agent Orange. So it's everywhere. Um, everywhere people are, just re reach out to them, ask them, how are you doing? You know, ask them about their war experience. Have you had any war experience? Have you been affected by war? And how can we help each other get through the effects now in our present day war? We're the first female Americans to have a climb this way up to Hamburg Hill. We're the first ones. Don't let my tax dollars pay for bullets. It's not my idea for war to go on. It almost destroyed me when I was young from the effects of losing my soldier. I'm sure I'm not alone in my plight to end this horrible fight. Don't let my tax dollars pay for bullets. It's a crime. The government insists you believe, puts fear in your mind to make you all go blind. It's a game you'll never win. A game that has been played out again and again. Don't let my tax dollars pay for bullets. It wasn't my idea to go to war. Was it yours? Hi, I'm standing on top of Hamburger Hill and we dedicate Mother Teresa's medal to these hills. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you bless each and every person that was involved in this terrible battle. We ask that you lift up the families and friends of, on all sides that are still suffering from the effects of this terrible, terrible war. We ask, Lord, that everybody in each of their face pray for world peace. Pray for world peace in each of your face, that we never see anything anything like this again on these lands and hopefully we will be able to heal on the other lands that we are involved with now and we just ask this in every faith and in my faith in Jesus' name amen After going to Vietnam, I wanted to have a, a deeper understanding into other cultures and how it worked and get close to some of the people from different faiths. I wanted to bring certain major religions and certain sacred people that I knew of and put it on the poster like the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, uh, Jesus, Gandhi, Buddha, the Star of David, and the Islam symbol. And the reason I put the Islam symbol and the Star of David together is because I know that I know this today, uh, as I've been on my journey, that many of the people in Israel, in both faiths, really do want to live in peace and harmony. This community was founded uh, back in 1972. Originally, it's the idea of uh, a man by the name of uh, Bruno Hussar. He started as soon as he came to Jerusalem to organize different uh, seminars and meetings between Jews, Christians, and Muslims. He left behind him a small book where he believed that we are all the sons of Abraham and we should learn to live together, to share this land together. 
uh, whenever there are conflicts, whether they are between nations or between individuals, within even the same house, our nature is always to put the blame on the other. You know, I'm, I'm okay, he's not okay, she's not okay. So when every individual begins to believe that we are all part of it. Yeah. Okay. So when you begin to believe that you also have responsibility to this reality, to this moment, and to check yourself, what can you do to change it, okay? Instead of always blaming the others. So you start thinking about maybe a community, a place where they live together, work together, bring up their kids together. Today there are 60 families living here, half uh, Jewish, half Arab. The Arab families could either be Muslims or Christians. So we are three communities living here together. What is common between all those who join the community, even until this day, we still take new families. It is uh, the awareness about the others as equals. The willingness to give their kids a uh, different chance, which they call more realistic to help them grow up with the kids of the other communities. A natural thing happened here in 85, there were already about 20 kids living here with their parents. So they, it was decided to open school for our kids. It's elementary until sixth grade, including uh, nursery and kindergarten. So this was the first school to be ever opened in this country on such basis of teaching both in Arabic and in Hebrew. So the staff of teachers is both Arab and Jewish. So the way it is, it reflects more the reality in the country, the diversity. The whole idea is here uh, to find the common between us, not to find what separates us, okay? I am very happy myself as well as I think everybody else to have given the chance for my two kids to grow up here in this community. Sometimes you, you think that joining this community being Jewish or being an Arab, so like you are with your team against the other team, but uh, the facts of life here are much more complicated. Uh, uh, we go through discussions and arguments and at some point we have to vote and to decide about that specific subject, which way to deal with it. So when you raise your finger to say yes or against, you realize that there are others from the two sides are on your side and others are on the other side. So you begin to develop your humanity much faster, I think, whether you are Jewish or Palestinian. I think identities take a lower uh, place on the, on the ladder and instead on the higher level, it is the more the spiritual, the human connection that takes place. We have taken this around the world. Great. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, beautiful. I want you to have that. Three in each of your face, four more pieces. I will put it on the wall inside. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, sisters, all the way. Beautiful. Gandhi, oh Gandhi, how I loved your inspiration. How you taught me to cleanse my body, my soul with pure, pure water and rest. It was you who taught me not to fight back, not to attack those who used their fists, those who threw the rocks, those who knocked us out, those who tossed us about. What a teacher you were to me. My God, you set so many of your people free to live side by side as you walk down the street in peace and harmony with every culture, every religion, alongside of you peaceful fasting and now so many people are passing beside your grave to honor your ways um, Gandhi actually died a few years before I was born but he made a, a, a huge impact on me in my life and I was so glad to know his story and actually he was my inspiration later in my life to fast <laughs> You know, people can't understand that there's so much poverty and, you know, everybody thinks of themselves and they fight wars so they can have more stuff. They can have some more bigger houses, and they can have bigger cars, and they can have beautiful, more beautiful clothes, and all this stupid stuff that means nothing. So I'm, I'm just angry at, at, you know, the selfishness in all of us, you know what I mean? And it always just makes me feel sad when I see something like that. And he refused him. He refused the money I gave him. He just refused it. See, he refuses it.
because every time we are fighting in Middle East, that's for oil. What will oil give you? <laughs> Not peace and harmony inside. <laughs> I know. You are fighting all the battles, taking all the lives just for the mere business attitude. I know, own. I know. Well, let me tell you something. That is not the common people in the United States' idea at all. We do not want this. American homes, this is what it's come to. When we put so much money into destructive things, this is what happens to the mainstream people. And it's happened many places in the world. And we're here amongst friends. Three times in my life I've been homeless. I understand what these people feel like. It's not easy, especially when the cold weather is coming. corporate America and I can't get work and it's like you know what I'm here I'm here <laughs> I, I mean I, I work for a governor I work for a governor I serve in a governor's cabinet and so I'm here because damn it we have to take our work sure back. we got to start over I've talked to quite a few people pretty intelligent people standing around the media is characterizing this as a bunch of unemployed hippies <laughs> ha, that are here young people that don't know what they're doing yes. and that are just activists Yes. And I need this activist energy and the young people to help me as a middle-aged American exactly. that was in the middle class, that's fallen down. I'm not quite out of it, yeah. but I'm pretty darn close. Karen, can we go back in time a little bit mm -hmm. from when you were a child? And um, I'd like to hear a little bit of that story. You, you mentioned that your father was with Robert, the night, Robert Kennedy the night that he passed. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I was raised in upstate New York, and my, my dad was a pretty fierce, independent Democrat. He, he ran for a New York assembly. I don't think he made it, but he was in a county. He was a county commissioner. Um, but he was a strong Democrat. So in upstate New York, he was the Kennedy campaign manager for Robert. Um, my dad was a pharmacist and a small business owner, and um, politics were always discussed at our house, and what was happening in the world, and what we needed to do differently. And after both of the two Kennedys and Martin Luther King were assassinated, and after Vietnam, I watched this country drastically change. Yes. There's a lot of fear, and people have really shut down. It's obvious to me that you, you know, really enjoy the service work and the political arena. Um, would you have done something different uh, had he lived and do you think the world would have been a different place? And Miriam Williamson talks about the fact that we had um, JFK's assassination, Robert's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination and the Vietnam War and we have all the race issues we've never dealt with as a society and I think those five things have really shaped this country. And um, we need, I think we need to start having public debate about these things. I mean, the Kennedy assassinations and Martin Luther King just got shelled down and pushed into our belly. And um, I think part of what's happening here is they're starting to come out. Hi, hi, my name is Christopher Geist. I took a freight train ride here a thousand miles from small town Florida. I walked 50 miles over five days and I traveled here for 22, with $22 uh, to inspire the people 
and say we need global uh, unity. That's, that was my message. They even wanted to ask to fight because of the money. They always say it's because of the religion or something like that, but it's not. It's because of the money, always. Always. Each them one word. One word. How you feel. What would that word be? Inspired. Yes. <laughs> Love. <laughs> Connected. We can. Hopeful. Feelings run deep, sadness, loss, a senseless war, taking away your hopes, your dreams, healing the feelings that run so deep. When will I ever feel complete? I'm with Douglas Howell, a very good friend. I admire all the things that he's done throughout his years to help the veterans and I want to talk to him about his experiences in Vietnam and what happened post-Vietnam and what he's doing today. Now you were... Um, I was a uh, corpsman and uh, uh, one of the platoons. Each Marine Corps platoon has two corpsmen, so the two of us were charged with the health and welfare of... Uh, 190 Marines. That was quite a responsibility that you had on your shoulders. You know, when you're 18 and 19 year years old, uh, sometimes you don't understand the depth of your responsibility uh, until things happen. You went through quite a battle at one point, um, and that was quite difficult, wasn't it? Uh, what, what happened was that we had been told there was a large concentration of uh, North Vietnamese regular army the, the juncture of the, the demilitarized zone and the border of Laos. And our job was to flush them out. Um, as we made our way through the foothills, um, we, we lost 13 of our men, um, eight killed, five wounded. And the next morning, we tried to outflank that enemy, but they were on to us. And they set up on a mountain top. And as we came up that mountain, there was a little saddleback, a depression. As we went down into the depression, a North Vietnamese Army regiment ambushed us, and the fire was so intense, we couldn't dig our fighting holes deep enough. Uh, we held on the best we could, but that night, we all were convinced that we were not going to come home. The next morning, as the Vietnamese army was making a final assault, Lima Company from this, this other part of our battalion also was reaching our lines, and they met each other and surprised each other. If it had not been for Lima Company, none of us uh, would be here today. Shocking, I would say, more than shocking. You know, there's a lot of mixed up emotions that go along with coming back out of something like that. You know, why did you survive, everybody else didn't, and yet you have to come back. I was really a very lost mm -hmm. soul. I hitchhiked around the country, uh, sleeping out in the roadsides and um, stealing food from grocery stores. I was really, really in bad shape. I did not have contact with my family, but my oldest brother was a connection for me. Didn't matter if I called him at three o'clock in the morning or I showed up unannounced at three o'clock in the morning, he would answer like he was expecting me. Yeah. His, first, <laughs> his first question was, are you all right? Uh -huh. He was my ground, mm. my connection to the earth. He died at the age of 50 in 1994, and he left a big hole in my heart. I went to the uh, inauguration of the, the wall, the Vietnam Wall, mm -hmm. and I went there with him. And on the trip down there, I started telling him about my experiences in Vietnam. And I had never told anyone him before, never. And he said to me that I needed to do something for other people. And what I needed to do is I needed to write down those experiences. And he said, 
Just write them down like they were letters home as they come to you. And he said, I'll even give you a title for that. He said, call it, The Night is Dark and I Am Far From Home. And it was so perfect. It was so perfect. During and after my trips back to Vietnam, I was writing emails back home describing my experiences. And after a while, I began to think, well, maybe this could be what my brother was talking about. And so after the last trip, I realized that, yeah, this, this, this is exactly what he was talking about. It's not the same thing, but this is what he meant. The company that you um, are part of, they've come together, right? John, they got in touch with you. What was that conversation like? Well, there were two conversations. One, uh, several years after, um, probably 2002, 2003, a guy by the name of Joe Holt. He's kind of the keeper of our list of people's great guy. Just love Joe. Um, he called me and said, Doc, we're having a reunion. We'd like you to come. That was the first time that I was reunited with uh, my Marine Corps company. It scared the crap out of me. I didn't know what to expect. I mean, for all those years, I was feeling guilt. I was feeling like I was a terrible person because I didn't do enough on that hill to save lives, which was my job. And I didn't save enough of them. And I had spent decades uh, with my own remorse about that. But I went to that reunion and um, we all just wrapped our arms around each other. And, mm -hmm. We laughed and cried together and, you know. You, you were brothers. We were brothers. Mm -hmm. And we will be brothers to the last breath of the last man of this company. I'm sure you will. Uh, a few years later, John Olson called me and said he was getting some guys together to go back to Vietnam and uh, to place a memorial on that hill in Vietnam. And he asked me if I would join. How did you feel about that? You know, I... Um, I didn't really think about it at first. I said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, as the time got closer, my anxiety began to increase and I began to have more bad nightmares, And uh, but I was committed. And so 10 of us went back in 2008, 10 old battle-hardened Marines. And when we got there, we we're all holding hands, just like kids, you know, because <laughs> we were, uh, well, the last we were, time you we were, were together, you were kids, <laughs> kind well, of. You weren't that old. You know, that's a wonderful point. Mm -hmm. We were still kids. Yes. And all we had was each other. Uh, we didn't know what to expect. We didn't know what to expect of ourselves when we saw the country. We didn't know what to expect from the Vietnamese when we got there. So there was a lot of anxiety about going back that first time. We were not able to find our hilltop. It, it is in a very remote area in the mountains uh, near the border of Laos, and uh, we were not able to find it. Um, and we also realized we were not fully prepared. You know, 40 years didn't make us any younger or stronger and <laughs> didn't make those hills easier to climb. Right. You know, yeah. it, is, it isn't easy when you're yeah. older like that. Yeah, right. And, and but it was a remarkable experience. Uh, e even at, at that point, my, my first feeling was that it didn't matter that we didn't find the hill. You know, we touched the earth. We put our boots on the earth. We made the attempt. We went back there for our brothers. And we got much more out of it than, than we thought mm -hmm. we would. And when you met together and you, you did do that climb, you could see the hill from where you were, is that correct? We thought we were about three miles from the stream bed, which was right near the base of our Hill 362, where the, the majority of uh, the company was, was uh, uh, killed or, in, or wounded. So we thought we were close, but it was obvious that it was taking us too long. And uh, some of the guys were not in the physical shape enough right. to do it. And we realized that 
probably the safest thing for us to do is just turn around and go back mm -hmm. and not have any casualties. The second trip over, I went back with Michael Carey. Major Carey was a platoon leader back in 1966, and he was on that hill with us. And he was with us in 2008 when we made that attempt. Well, the very next year, 2009, he and I decided to go back. We wanted to find that hilltop uh, to place those memorials. We thought we had found the top of Hill 362. And on the first day climbing, Major Carey was injured mm. and was not able to continue. So I went up alone with the two guides, the two Vietnamese guides, and buried the memorials there. Truly a watershed moment in my life. We were on top of this hill with uh, vines and jungle and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all complete open and yet con confining at the same time. And as I was digging this hole, I, I got the sense that it was a very crowded hilltop. I was not alone. I felt really inadequate to do the job and yet it was left to me great deal of, um, of emotion that I had trouble identifying in myself. Mm. That why would it be me after all these years of so much guilt? You know, um, Doug, I've come to recognize that so much of my feelings of guilt um, have been false guilt and also the remorse and false responsibilities that I took on my shoulders that I know that I didn't cause war, but when Johnny died, I felt guilty. I thought I, I could have saved him, and I don't know how I thought I could have saved him, but I felt a lot of guilt, a lot of guilt, and it took me a lot of years to realize that it was false and that I took on way more than my fair share for the responsibility of that war or any other war, you know? Same with my dad. He was affected by World War II, and I, I really was convinced somehow I was going to turn it all around for him, you know. I think that that, that is something that, um, um, that is m most difficult for people to understand. The guilt is it's not a clean box of guilt. The guilt is that because I was not brave enough to do more, I must have been a coward of some sort. The guilt has much more to do with the associations that you could not help your brothers as much as it is, why did they die and I didn't? It is a very complex guilt. And because of that, it erodes the foundation of your ego. Mm. It erodes that part of your life so that you become very uncomfortable with yourself. Mm -hmm. What we're learning today about PTSD uh, is it's finally learning. Mm -hmm. You know, back in, back in my day, there, 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 was, there was almost no program and it was never offered. And uh, the psychology, the, the psyche of... of uh, of the American populace was such that uh, they weren't very enamored of our our returning uh, military. Uh, so many of us were ashamed, or at least uh, we didn't talk about it unless we were with each other. Um, mm -hmm. But today there are mm -hmm. hundreds of programs, and we're learning a lot about uh, the nuances of PTSD and how they affect people. A person is not going to be helped until that person is ready to be helped. Exactly. Until that person figures out a way that they can be okay inside of themselves, mm -hmm. it's okay. To admit they need help to become weak enough to say, I need help. Nothing's going to happen. And that is the hard part. You take a soldier, a Marine, a sailor, an Air Force person who is trained to go to war, trained to be tough, 
the only thing that's going to save him or her afterwards is to admit to weakness. But I, th I feel that in admitting the weakness that it takes a tremendous amount of, course, of strength. Of course. <laughs> I was naive enough um, that for the longest time I didn't, I didn't know why I was kind of screwed up. I didn't know why I was disenfranchised from society. I didn't know why I was a loner. But part of me was okay with that mm -hmm. because I just began to figure out well, that's who I am. Instead of realizing that I was disenfranchised because of some certain things, and I didn't need to be, you have to realize what the situation is before you can do something about it. I think that uh, for the troops returning from war today, they have many more resources if they're willing to take them. It seemed to me that they didn't um, either understand or they didn't make the efforts like they did in the, when they came back this time. And I think that a lot of the Vietnam vets were uh, uh, mm. very helpful to some of those uh, young men returning. Yeah. You know. And, Can uh, I tell you a story? Sure. My wife had saved a clipping from a newspaper about a young Marine who was in the same battalion I was in two generations, or a generation later, two decades later. And he had made a video, a documentary, about the 25 guys in his battalion who were killed in uh, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And so I called him. I viewed his documentary and I called him. We had a long talk. And we slowly but surely started to become friends. Uh, and he only lived about 150 miles from me. So he came to Detroit, we went to a Tigers game together, and um, we sat up a couple of nights late until the night talking. And he has said to me recently that um, I don't know what I would have done without a mentor. He has said to many of his people, if you find a Vietnam vet, embrace him. I, I, I love hearing that. When the soldier that got sick and had to go to the hospital. Can you tell that story to us? Sure. So this uh, Marine, we, we, had, uh, we landed in Hanoi, um, and the second day we were there, he knocked on my hotel door about 10 o'clock at night, and I could tell by his color something was wrong with him. And he said, Doc, I'm in pain. I can't take it anymore. He said it felt like kidney stones and he's had a history of them. So he and I got into a taxi and we went to the French hospital of Hanoi. And we walked into the lobby there and went up to the counter and I said to the gentleman at the counter, my friend here is very sick, he needs to see a doctor right away. And the doctor that night on Friday night asked me what we were doing in Vietnam. And I told him, we were a bunch of Marines, we were here at the Vietnam War, and we came back to lay some memorials for our brothers that were killed. He looked me dead in the eye and said, if you were in the war, you get priority, top priority right now. You could have knocked me over with a feather. Are you kidding me? In Hanoi, where we, in a space of... Ten days over Christmas in 19, whatever year it was, dropped 20,000 tons of bombs on these people. <laughs> and as an American Marine, to go back there and say, if you were in the war, you get top priority right now. <laughs> I didn't understand that. And something on my way back home, I realized that that kind of human compassion mm -hmm. is their strength. We keep going back and back and back, and, uh, but our plan is to go back to a battle site mm -hmm. that is as remote as can be found and lay some memorials, not just for those Marines who were killed on that hill, I want to lay those memorials for all of the Vietnamese that we killed.
There was an awful lot of them. I want to. I want to lay. <coughs> excuse me. Sorry. I want to lay that memorial for the tragedy of war. For what we do to each other. And for the war that happens inside of us when that war is finished. It is a war that takes a lifetime. I'm so very lucky that I was able to survive the war. But I think I'm even luckier that I've been able to survive these five decades after that war without killing myself in one way or another, trying to escape that first war. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to end wars. Mm -hmm. We are human animals, and we are subject to territorialism, to unreasonable, irrational thought. What we need to do is to find a way to recover those people that we asked to prosecute those wars. I believe that the, our purpose here on earth is to make other people. That's, that's what we're here for, to make other people. Mm -hmm. Our jobs and what we do and, uh, are just the things we use to occupy our lives while we go about making other people. And the juxtaposition of that is that we also create this situation that we take lives. Mm -hmm. As incongruent as it may seem, we take lives and we make lives. For me, what I want to do is I want to reach out mm -hmm. for those people who are struggling, mm -hmm. for those people who are lost, for those people who feel like there is no out. There is an out. There is a way to accept yourself because that's where it has to start with. It has to start with accepting yourself. And that's the hardest step because once you accept yourself and all of your frailties, uh, then, you can, th then you can begin to accept other people's acceptance of you. When, you. when you did come back, Doug, you went on and you went on to college, didn't you? You, you went... Well, I, I tried to go to school when I first came back and I, I just could not right. concentrate on my studies. What I, what I realized was that what happens with PTSD, or at least with my experience with PTSD, is that... Um, it, it, it's insidious. Mm -hmm. When I first came back, I wasn't feeling what I felt later. I began to get more and more and more uncomfortable with myself as the months and years went on. There was a, a period of uh, perhaps decompression from the war itself. And then trying to fit back into civilian life, trying to become a regular person, became more difficult and more difficult. Because I was supposed to be normal again. But uh, I'm sorry, I'm not normal. <laughs> I'm not ever going to be normal. And, that, and that's the difficult part. Mm -hmm. Because when you begin to realize that you're not normal, something inside of you is broken you begin to feel lost. And the only people who you are safe with are your brothers that you were there with. Those are the only people you feel safe with. Thank God there's a foundation of safety with your brothers and that's beautiful because they're the ones that understand it more than perhaps anybody could. Nobody could understand it like you guys. My brother-in-law David does that he gets together with his some of the members that were over in Vietnam with him and yeah. I think it's a I, it's a fabulous thing I also think what's good is that maybe the wives and the family members get together and talk and heal whatever wounds that they might have from the effects of war and I think that's a real important aspect as well that, that's, yeah. that's an incredibly important because those women yeah. live with us <laughs> yeah you know um, um, a few years ago um, <coughs> we went to a, um, a movie about um, Vietnam veterans in Michigan. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of veterans at this place. And at the end of it, we were coming home, and uh, Colette said to me, she said, you know what I've noticed? 
when Vietnam veterans together, it doesn't matter if there's two of you or 2,000 of you, it's family. You are family immediately. And she says, you talk to each other. You don't talk to me. You don't talk to your kids. You don't talk to anybody else. Mm -hmm. But you guys talk to each other and you never met each other mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what I spoke to. Mm -hmm. Yes. We feel safe. Yes. With those people who kept us safe in the worst times of our lives. Exactly. Because really, you're not trying to leave them out. I know that my mother, a lot of the times, would feel so totally left out of my dad's uh, war experience. So I think that groups for families of the vet, it would be so useful for them to understand certain parts that you can't enter in. And it's not that because you don't love them, it's just a private place that probably no one else can really quite get it, except for your fellow veterans that you've gone over there with. You know what I mean? I would have loved to have had a group for my mom and say, Mom, look at this, there's a group here, there's other women that have gone through what you're going through. Sure. And it's not your job to fix your, for Daddy, or it's not your job to fix anybody. It's your job to feel good inside of you, and it will be very useful and helpful to any, you know, your husband or your veteran. Or, and for a child coming up through what I came up through, why is Daddy so sullen? Why is he moving away from us? Why is he doing this? Because you do think it's you, and it's not. And I think those kind of talks with the families and the, the children of veterans, it would, it would help so much for them to know. It doesn't have a thing to do with you. You are loved by Daddy. It's just that there's a place in him that needs to have time to heal some of the pains of war. I think that's, I, I think that's exactly true, because true? just because they, uh, they can't under, understand what that Mm -hmm. dark place, place is doesn't mean that they can't understand that it exists. Thank God that there are groups now, like you're talking about, like I'm talking about, out there where they can go and, and have help. And I think as the family, you know, heals and not takes that on, it, it's very helpful to the, the veteran. Sure. The problem is in recognizing it and, exactly. and getting to that mm -hmm. point. I that's see. it. And I think that's part of it. I think the first step, like you say, Doug, is the recognition. What I had thought of before was, was that today we have lots of programs mm -hmm. to help vets, if and when they're willing. Mm -hmm. Today is, is different than in my day in many ways. And, uh, today we have an all-volunteer force, mm -hmm. and because of that, we have a limited number, and because of that, they rotate back over and over and over again. And the cumulative stress of repeated tours of duty has to be incredibly difficult for, for those people. Of course, every conflict is different in its own unique way, but uh, the brutality of, of war uh, is unchanging. And it's that brutality that is so difficult to keep inside of you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I did back then, when people asked me about Vietnam, I made a contract with them. And I said, I will tell you about my experiences in Vietnam. However, when I start shaking, when I start crying, when it looks like I'm losing control of myself, you do not get to stop me. Mm -hmm. Right. You have to hear the whole thing. Right. Mm -hmm. For me, this wasn't a deep thought process, an intellectual process that I went through that as a, as a way to heal. Mm -hmm. Somehow, retelling was actually therapeutic for me, unbeknownst to me. I didn't realize until recently how many ghosts I put to rest in my returns mm -hmm. to Vietnam. How many ghosts I put to rest in writing that book. Mm -hmm. What I began to realize is that, that that thing inside of you, that PTSD thing, that you can't hear it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, there's no laboratory work that can prove it. That thing that is so personal, so private, so difficult, that you are so afraid of all your life, mm -hmm. If you're willing to stick your hands in there and pull it out and, and get a little bloody, you can deal with it. 
you have to turn around and embrace it. You have to understand it's part of you. You have to understand it will never leave you. And you have to love it. <laughs> and it's... I'm sorry. It's okay. It's the hardest love on the planet. You have to love something that you hate. <laughs> but you have to love it because it's part of you and it's going to be permanent. And once you are able to do that, you begin to accept yourself as an okay person. And that's a pretty magical moment. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, w I would have gladly given up my life on that hill in exchange for being rid of the monster that has ridden on my heart in the last 50 years. And I would gladly do that to protect my brothers who did that for me. Mm. <laughs> I don't mean to say by any means that I am healed, but I think I'm almost at a spot where I can say I welcome them into my grave with me mm -hmm. because they are part of me. Mm -hmm. Like I've asked other people, but I've asked them like this, if you were president for the day, what would you want to say to the, your, 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 the public? I don't want to ask that. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I won't. I won't. <laughs> what I'm going to ask you is, is what would you like to say to the next generation that's coming up? What would, what would be your message to give them? Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. You know, I think that every generation thinks that their youth was the best. Growing up in the 50s was just unbelievable. I mean, we had the world, and the world was opening, and uh, it was awesome. But I think every generation thinks that they have a great youth because it's their youth. Mm -hmm. I, I see us becoming disconnected, somehow losing the, 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 the little things that kept us connected as people in a way that we recognized each other. Not just the fact that the kids have got their face in a cell phone constantly, but that's part of it. When we call someplace, we don't talk to a person anymore, we talk to a computer, but that's part of it. We have a, uh, a dispassionate connection with each other. What I, what I would say to them is that remember, we really are on this earth for a very short time. Mm -hmm. And everyone's story is different. I don't care if you've been in a war or not been in a war. In every life, there is some difficulty, some pain. We used to have phone booths. Mm -hmm. And the phone booth was made for an average person. But someone who is seven foot two, who has no, not a care in the world, wouldn't be able to fit in that phone booth to make a phone call. And a dwarf would have the same problem. We all have our difficulties fitting into life for whatever reason. And I believe we've, we've lost the civility to understand that about each other. Perhaps not lost it, but I'm seeing it fade. I'm seeing it go away. And damn it, it was fading in me. And now that I'm older, I'm beginning to recognize that. And I so desperately want to go back and I want to reach out and I want to say, don't, don't lose that compassion for life. Don't lose that passion for humanity. Don't lose that. Don't get away from that. That is where we belong. That's our ground. We need to, we need to understand each other. Now, I don't have the naive hope that that would end war. But I do think that that would help us in just common social, civil stuff. 
I'm not smart enough to know what the best thing is. Uh -huh. I can't give a piece of advice that would heal the world. Would that I could. But if I was just to say one thing to people, I would say, don't, leave, don't lose your common civility. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't lose it. Those generations coming up, maybe the generations that are going to just change so many things, and that's my hope and that's my dream, yeah. that, it, that it will go in a direction um, that is going to be a healing direction. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that we all, this generation gets healed and their generations heal quicker. Mm -hmm. Two years after Johnny died and I was in the street, I didn't get the proper help I needed. That is another reason that I, I am so um, passionate about helping others get proper help or getting better help than, than they, they might, better help than I got. Um, what they did is they never asked me what was really wrong and how was I feeling. Um, they just, you know, plugged me full of a medication. And they're doing that so much with soldiers now. And yes, maybe medication has its place in the beginning, but little by slowly they need to get rid of that, uh, the medication, find other avenues to get to the, the root cause of the trauma. When you have trauma in your life, you hold on to all kinds of feelings. You, you, it's a protection. You hold it in. And later, when it's safe, that's when you bring it out. And many people that I've talked with that have lived with, lived with veterans, and I did live with my veteran, um, I tell them, you know, allow that veteran to go in the other room and just even scream in the pillow, but don't worry about it. He's getting it out, or she's getting it out. L you know, allow the, the process of those emotions to flow. And uh, so anyway, I, it's my hope and uh, prayer that all kinds of uh, different uh, groups and meetings will be birthed out of this uh, film, and I hope that these precepts will help them do that. We are people around the world who have been affected by war, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and our lives in many ways have become disrupted. We believe in our own individual faith, and that we could learn from others with an open mind, eliminating any parts of extremes that tells anyone to do harm to any man, woman, or child. And we have hope for all to be healed from these effects of war by praying in each other's face for peace, love, harmony, especially for forgiveness of ourselves and others. In this restoration of body, mind, and spirit, we gradually come to make a choice to surrender to a holy being of our own understanding, and we accept ourselves and others as they are. Through this process we grew and stood alongside of our brothers and sisters and helped them grow as well. As we came out of isolation and shared our experiences by writing and sharing our stories and listening to others share theirs, our mind, our body, and souls continued to heal. As we listened and shared, we sometimes identified with other people's stories, and as this happened, it brought up repressed feelings from our subconscious, and this gave us opportunity to work these denied feelings out and share them with other safe, trusted people. We found many healthy ways to heal, meetings online, web meetings, exercise, learning healthy eating habits, and outside help, such as therapy. We found safe ways to express our pain and pent up feelings, such as sadness, anger, and feelings we had buried inside us, feelings we couldn't express when we were going through a trauma. And primal therapy was a great way to emotionally release this pain. We are self-supporting by voluntary contributions. We have website anonymous meetings and go by first names only. As we continue to process these recovery precepts, we shared this with others who have been in war to gather understanding of PTSD, how it affects them and others. We continue to build our own spirituality, understanding that self-forgiveness and forgiveness of others is what we are all striving for. 
We continued our recovery physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And we share this with others. And we grow through these precepts each and every day of our lives. God inspired. What did they really say, Jesus, Mohammed, Jesus, Gandhi, Mohammed, Abraham? Abraham? Not some evil plan. The radicals are out to trick you. Let they them. lie about what the religions really said to confuse you and make you dead. Did the holy man say to fight your brother, your sister, and steal from them too? Did they say to kill them? For what? For money? For, money. for oil? For land? for land? Is this really God's plan or the plan of the self-centered man? Self -centered man. No more bloodshed. No more people dead. God really said, love your enemies. Do good for those who persecute you. Just love. Just love. the first stone so i keep all my rocks in my pocket with so much hunger and starvation in this world shouldn't this be the topic the topic who just said peace comes from within never seek it without my answer is show me the route too many leaders and not enough scouts gandhi said hate the sin love the sinner i invite you to dinner moses said i have become an alien in a foreign land now i understand we all read from the same good book we all trying to go to the same good place look every religion is all the same we all human but sometimes the things we do is so inhumane we need to get our act together right now and hurry up before jesus come back down for years now we've been praying for the people